Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 1385th meeting of the Brighton and Sussex Medical Chirurgical Society. And we have been dormant for 18 months. Last month, we had an inaugural lecture. And today, we're very happy to welcome four high powered lady hand surgeons. We're making the statement here and the four younger ladies over there, they're all very inspired by this. <laughs> so when you guys retire, then they will become you in turn. And I just want to tell you a little story. When I went into ophthalmology, I thought it's a very small area and I could learn it in one day. And then I realized it was a little bit more complicated than that. And now we have different subspecialties. And I guess when you go into orthopedics and you go into hand surgery, you think that might be it, but actually the hand has so many parts as well. And we're going to hear all about this. And I think we're going to start with Lisa Turet. You, I guess that's about intrinsic muscles, which other people don't worry about, but I understand you do. So, <laughs> okay. A great round of applause for Lisa Turet. <laughs> Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting us, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues. Um, I'm not claiming to be intrinsically clever. This is just I want you people to sort of have an understanding of the hand and how amazing it is and why we all actually enjoy really working with it. We are brainy because of our hands and it's our hands that are the clever things. We're using a, a radio microphone. Can people give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Have I turned it all on? Right, excellent, you all fell for it. Food for thought, it takes um, about 15 joints to make that simple thumbs up gesture and you've just used about 30 muscles and you haven't even thought about it. Um, that's how clever the hand is. We take them for granted, they're out there and they do so much for us. Um, this list is by no means exhaustive, but it gives you an idea of the range of uses we have for our hands. And if you're lucky and your hands are fully working, then um, you're going to do all of these things without even giving it a second thought. We look after ourselves, we're creative, we express ourselves, we do all of these things. Uh, we use them for sport, defense, attack. Um, and this is just for you to realize how incredible this little device is at the end of your wrist. Surgeon colleagues of ours tell us that um, some of the orthopedic surgeons uh, say, don't trust anybody who operates on something small enough to swallow. And they're the ones who come to us as soon as they get anything wrong with their little paper cut on their fingers. Um, so you're probably all familiar with the homunculus. It's uh, the Latin for little man. The diagram of the uh, cortex there shows uh, um, just in 2D dimensions, but the 3D uh, model shows just how large the brain's uh, area is that, uh, looking after the hand. In fact, uh, the amount of your cortex that's governing your control and your sensory processing of what's going on in your hand is about the same amount of cortex as is looking after the whole of the rest of your body. Um, Dr. Penfield uh, was uh, credited with differentiating the motor and sensory areas, and um, this is just a really good visual representation of it. We were all told that humans are highly evolved and that's why we've got the hands we've got. And there's been a bit of a paradigm shift. A few years ago, a paleobiologist at George Washington um, called Michael uh, Bolter presented evidence that the human hand is probably actually less evolved than the chimpanzee. The, the chimpanzee fingers actually got longer because they're the ones that have developed for climbing the trees and, and getting their fruits. Our hands actually are more similar to our common ancestor. Um, and therefore, it looks like we've got the relatively longer thumb, but it's in fact the fingers that are, uh, are different. Our shorter thumb meant that we had to use tools. Um, and the fact that we have to use tools drove the uh, incredible size of our brains because we had to actually think about how to invent them. Another bit of a uh, myth, I suppose, is that everyone has always taught me for many years that uh, oh, the thing that makes us human is our opposable thumbs. And that is also not entirely true because we share um, opposable thumbs with a lot of the monkeys and the great apes. So um, we're not, it's not exclusively a human thing. Um, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans all have opposable thumbs. Um, and some of those such as baboons and Colobus monkeys from Asia and Africa do as well. 
The gorilla who also remained ground-based, you can see that their thumb is actually a little bit more in proportion and is probably more similar to the human hand. Um, and uh, this is the more primitive proportion. So we can probably just uh, step back from feeling all pious about that one. Um, the area that in our brain that controls the motor of our hand is actually very similar, but it's how we process that information that, that, that led us to have the increase in size of our brains. So a little anatomy, the intrinsics. First of all, if we're gonna talk about intrinsics, we just need to briefly cover what extrinsics are. Basically muscles that control our hand that arise outside the hand are extrinsic. And that's all your forearm muscles. They are um, uh, able to do grand movements, but nothing really fine. They're our power movements, but um, they're assisted by our intrinsics. Because they attach to more than one digit at a time, they usually are not very dexterous. Um, the only ones that are, are the index finger and the little finger, which we can do pinky pointers because they actually have their own um, extrinsic muscles. Those ones, interestingly, we just think of them as good spares, because if we need to use a bit of tendon tissue for somewhere else to reconstruct a ligament or do as a tendon transfer for somewhere that's been ruptured or injured, we borrow those ones. So intrinsic muscles are the ones that are highly specialized. They do fine work rather than power, but if they are weak, you will notice um, a functional change in your hand. On the little finger side of the hand, the bulk of the flesh tissue that you can feel there, those are, we call those the hypothena muscles. And those mainly control the little finger, but what they also do is they deliver the uh, little finger border of your hand out into the plane of the hand so that it comes around to meet our thumb so that we've got all our um, uh, ability for pinching and uh, manipulating objects. And it's made up of the, these muscles. They're usually supplied by the ulnar nerve, not exclusively, but virtually. The intrinsic muscles on the thumb side of the hand, we call that the thena eminence. Those are quite bulky muscles. And again, they are controlling the position of the thumb in order to deliver it to face our fingers to do all our dexterous activities. So they will abduct the thumb up out of the plane of the hand and bring it across the hand to face the other digits. Interossei muscles, you will probably, if you're not medically minded or uh, already trained, and I know we've got some who haven't yet gone through university or medical schools, um, but the interossei, those are the muscles that are actually between the bones of your hand, and you wouldn't even know that they were there, um, apart from the fact that they, oh, that's, the animation isn't working. I don't think. Oh, is it? Oh, good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so note that the middle finger moves very little, and all your other fingers move away from it and to it which is you know, just how our muscles are actually um, attached to it. These interossei are divided up into palmar ones and dorsal ones. The palmar ones, as you can see, aren't attached to the middle finger at all. And the dorsal ones are all um, get, um, heading off towards the middle finger. So the palmar ones, they will um, adduct and the dorsal ones abduct um, your fingers. And this is how you do your piece be with you signs and spread your fingers to catch a ball, um, reach that key on the piano. You can't do any of those without these interossei functioning. The one that is on the index finger, between the index finger and the thumb, is a very, very important one because that actually braces the index finger. So apart from being able to bring the, the index finger over towards the thumb, it actually will hold it there so that you can pinch firmly against it. And you'll find that that's really important if you're wanting to pinch a key to turn it. Um, and if you haven't got that function, you will really miss it. This is what they look like in a, uh, anatomical studies and they absolutely pack and fill that space between the bones. And that's why they get their name into osseae. The, the key pinch one um, is so important that if that muscle is actually wasted because of uh, nerve problems um, or um, injury, then you will adapt without even knowing how you've adapted it. And um, some of us will know, remember, Froman's sign. So when you actually test that muscle, if the muscle is weak, your body will adapt and you will instead use the tip of your thumb and flex it, which uses a different muscle altogether supplied by a different nerve just to adapt to that. Now, lumbricals, these are my favorites. I think these are amazing little muscles. Um, they really are genius. So if you're anyone here of an engineering mind, get your head around this. First of all, not only do they arise from a tendon and attach to a tendon, which is pretty unique. I don't think there's another muscle in the human body that will do that. 
it, <clears throat> it originates in the palmar aspect of your hand, but it will insert into the dorsal aspect of your hand. So it crosses through between the bones. And not only will it flex the first joint that it's crossing, but it will extend the joint next one up. So the lumbrical is the muscle that allows you to do that movement. Without that, you really can't do that movement at all. So there probably never would be an accordion player. They're magical little muscles and they arise from the, the deep flexor tendon. Um, the muscle that's onto the um, index finger and the middle finger is just a unipennate muscle. Um, the ones to the ring and the little finger are bipennate and they are actually stronger. They do assist in our power grip and they're partly why their power to the uh, um, uh, little finger and ring finger is so important when you're doing a, a power grips. They are supplied by different nerves. The median nerve supplies the index and middle finger and the ulnar nerve supplies the ones to the ring and little finger. Um, that has implications for us when we're diagnosing problems with the nerves in the hand, but we don't need to go into too much detail. So we obviously have to be aware of these muscles when we examine hands and obviously when we operate on them. Um, any fine imbalances between these uh, will cause changes to the posture of the hand. But one of the most simple and important things um, is our grip cascade. And I can guarantee that most people in here, if you're not a hand surgeon, will have taken this completely for granted. Bearing in mind that the lumbricals allow you to do that uh, flexion at the MCP first. When you're trying to grasp something large, like a pint of beer, when you bend your fingers, you grasp around it. You will always bend at your knuckles first. And then after that, you will start to flex the other joints of your fingers. And that allows us to grab large objects. That simple act is completely down to the fact that you've got intrinsics that function. Without that, you're just going to use your extrinsics. And if you just use extrinsics, bearing in mind this is a big muscle in your forearm, it will act on the joint that it's attached to first which will be the furthest one away. And if it curls it down from the furthest joint away and then the next joint and then the next joint, what it has the mass effect of is being unable to grasp a large object and you push it out of the way. So when people have an ulnar nerve palsy or an intrinsic muscle problem in their hand, they simply can't grasp up big objects. The pictures on the right are of a young lady who's got a, a neuromuscular condition that I treated a couple of years ago. Um, it's similar to Charcot Marie Tooth, where you get some small muscle wasting, born without any problems at all, and then this develops. So by the time she was 19 and a student, she was unable to uh, hold a pen. The hand on the right is one that has had surgery. The one on the left hasn't yet, but went on to have surgery. Um, and on the right, you can see they're being, both of these hands are being told to do the same thing. I'm just asking her to grip, curl the fingers in. And the one on the left just curls from the far end of the fingers and, and curls in. And the one on the right, she can actually do a proper cascade. And what I did for her was I borrowed one of her flexor tendons, split it into four, and then took it out where the lumbrical muscles would normally go and attach them to her tendons at the back. Um, and that was the end result. After some hand therapy and splinting and work, she ended up with normal functioning hands. So we ended up doing the second side as well. If your intrinsics are tight, it's a bit more of an unusual uh, occurrence, but you can get the intrinsics are tight, then it's very difficult for people to bend their fingers. We often see an imbalance of intrinsics in people with rheumatoid arthritis, where they can have some tightness of the intrinsics, but some laxity in the other joints. And they can end up with things that we call swan neck deformities, where they actually have great difficulty initiating flexion um, of their finger joints at all. And we have to release the intrinsics for, that to, for them to be able to function normally. Uh, even our chimpanzee uh, colleagues have uh, intrinsics and they do use, <laughs> not those chimpanzee colleagues, so our chimpanzee, um, and uh, they actually have quite well developed uh, intrinsics and that's because they actually have to take weight on their knuckles and so that does help them support uh, at the PIP joint and, and, and give them some sort of weight to their uh, extension forces at the PIP joint. There are numerous types of grip, all of which um, require more than just your extrinsic muscles. So because of your intrinsics, uh, we can do fine manipulation. Um, we can pick up a pen. We can then manipulate that pen and do fine activities with it. We operate on carpal tunnel syndrome. That will cause thena muscle wasting. You can see that this person's got some wasting of the muscles there. That affects the function. 
um, quite drastically. This is a revision um, release. We don't normally do the incisions quite this large, but that's where the median nerve runs and that's a surgical picture of us releasing one. On the nerve palsy will result in an intrinsic minus hand. Uh, so just one of the commonest things that we can see. This is quite a bad example, but you can see what a hand looks like when it's intrinsic and so not functioning. That's the posture the hand takes, the muscles that are all wasted. Um, we hopefully get to them before they get that bad. Um, so anybody who's got numbness or early stages of weakness gets referred to us. We can release the ulnar nerve and hopefully they won't end up at that end stage. So we take it almost for granted. We wouldn't even clean our teeth, scratch our nose, thread a needle without our intrinsic muscles like to give you a chance to have a little bit of a think about them, look after them, exercise them, make sure you keep them supple. They are your friend and without them, you really do miss them. Thank you very much. I'm Reen Johnson. I'm one of the hand surgeons here in uh, University Hospital Sussex. I'm just trying to work out what um, level everybody is. So I've met you lovely four, four lovely ladies who have come from Van Dean School. Is that right? Lovely people at the back. I'm non-medical. You're non-medical. Good, because I'm going to keep this really sensible. So uh, sensible. Yeah, not, not, too, not, not too much jargon. And... You people at the back, any junior doctors or medical students? Lovely. Okay. Shall we make it a little bit interactive? Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't worry. I'm not one of these awful people that's going to point. <laughs> but I do want. I don't want you to be. I don't want you to be very silent when I say. Does anybody know what this is? Okay. So just, just say anything. I really don't mind if it's if it's wrong. Anyway, so can you see that? I mean, it says my thumb hurts, doctor. Why am I just talking about the thumb? It's a small part of the hand, um, and the hand is a small part of the body. Um, but as you know, we actually just specialize in the hand and wrist, so there must be a lot to it, because we actually have a whole exam just on the hand as well. So um, it is quite important, as you've just heard my colleague Lisa um, say, but what, the reason I, I focus on this is because um, I find that in my clinical practice, I get a lot of referrals um, uh, for, well, for elective problems, for pathology uh, to do with the thumb. And a lot of uh, GPs will, will say, I think it's this, or it might be this, this, and this. Um, they might go to our musculoskeletal um, uh, the, the musculoskeletal units in the community, and we'll have a, a list of differential diagnoses around that area. And I thought it might be worth just looking at the um, at this area and trying to discern what, depending on what the history and examination is, what the differential diagnoses might be in trying to you know, separate them out. So there's a lot that can go on in that two centimeter radius around the anatomical snuff box. Do you guys remember what the anatomical snuff box is? Yeah. Do you know what the end? Yeah, absolutely. So it's just that little bit there. And so there's a lot that goes on around there. And lots of people come in and say, my thumb hurts. And I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate not on injury necessarily, the trauma, which we deal with, but more sort of um, uh, pathology that happens not as a result of injury. So they might come in and say, um, doctor, my thumb hurts at night and I can't do my buttons up or I can't pick up change. Does anybody know what that might signify? A symptom? Why can't they do their buttons up? Possibly. They feel like they're wearing gloves all the time. Can't do, can't pick up change. Sensation? So their numbness, they've got numbness in their fingers. Do you know what might cause that? If it's just in their thumb or it might be in their index finger. What's that? Yeah, nerve problem. So um, Lisa touched on that earlier on and she touched on the carpal tunnel. 
So we've got a big nerve called the median nerve and it goes in the carpal tunnel. And the carpal tunnel is in that part of the hand. And, um, and that's really common. So that's a really common thing that we see all the time. That's like our, our bread and butter. And I think it's in the top five of all operations, including hip, uh, well, knee replacement and cataracts and, and stuff. But so we deal with carpal tunnel all the time. So we talk to them and um, if they get to a point where they're numb all the time and they can't do their buttons up, that's quite advanced disease. So we, we examine them. And uh, does anybody in that row over there know what uh, is happening <laughs> with A? What's happened? Oh, I'm going like that. What's happening in A? Vague, vague pointing. Vague pointing. <laughs> mm, yeah, it could look like that, but no. We're, we're, we're talking about carpal tunnel. This is the examination of the carpal tunnel. We're going, yeah, it's going up and down, going up and down, maybe with one finger even, maybe like a percussion. <laughs> I'm doing it as well. What do we call that? Do you, have you heard of anything? Speak up, speak up. Yeah, Valen's test. Yeah, you're reading the books. You didn't hear that, did you? You read that. And, uh, and, 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 and the tapping tunnels. We heard that and it sometimes feels like electric shocks going up the, up the fingers. And Valen's, what's Valen's? The one on it's B, isn't it? It, it? Yeah, B. So they're doing that, aren't they? And they're flexing, and that's supposed to increase the pressure in the carpal tunnel and therefore on the median nerve. And that reproduces their symptoms. Um, Durkin's, which is where you can press on the carpal tunnel itself and press on the median nerve, also reproduces their symptoms. And you and that D picture actually shows them doing both at the same time, Phelan's and Durkin's. And if that re, those are called provocative tests, and they help our diagnosis. So we've done our exam, uh, 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 taken the history, and we've uh, done the examination, and we use these little tests to sort of aid our diagnosis and other things if it's a little if it's not barn door then we might you know send them for some an investigation like nerve conduction studies which i'm not necessarily going to, i'm not going to go into now so we uh so we can we can treat that and, and lisa showed you a picture where we, we make an incision there and release the pressure on the nerve so that's one reason people might have thumb pain so they might come in and say i get thumb pain when i pick my baby up does anybody, that's a bit more tricky. It's not, it's not as common. Does anybody have any idea what that might be? Here's your sort of like textbook, young mum holding a little toddler, her baby, isn't it cute? And, uh, and then there's another mum um, holding her thumb thing. Oh gosh, this is awful. Anybody? No? Okay, so um, my colleagues here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, de quervains. Yeah, we love eponyms in orthopedics and, and medicine in general. So de quervains, it's so if you if you uh put your thumb up like that and you're a reasonably slim person, most people are slim around the wrist, too. Um, you can see the tendons going up the thumb, can't you? And the ones that are more radial are the ones that can get inflamed or um, get irritated by a change uh, in the sort of covering of that tendon uh, that holds it in place. We've got our extensor tendons are on the back of our hands because they extend our fingers and, and our thumb. Um, and there are different compartments. There are six compartments. And the first compartment here has tendons in there. And then this whole picking up and the repetitive action can... Yes, uh, and it's a metaplastic, the minimum metaplastic, the cells actually change around the sheath that encases those uh, tendons. And then that can be like sandpaper for the gliding of the tendons under that sheath. And then they can get irritated and it can be really, really sore. Does anybody know what this is? What am I doing here? Well, it's not me doing it, but it's, uh, it's an examination. So this is textbook for you guys over there who are probably going to do exams soon. Um, this is called Finkelstein's test. So remember I was talking about um, provocative tests like in carpal tunnel, we have the Phelan's and the Durkin's and that. This is Finkelstein's and I told you we like eponyms. So um, this, is, this is going to be painful. 
and I find that this is painful anyway. If you do what the, well, how it's described in the book, it's actually quite painful even if you don't have de Quervain's syndrome. But, uh, and I find it much more useful to just uh, palpate along there because they tend to be quite sore anyway if they, if they have a de Quervain syndrome. So here on the, uh, on the left of your screen, you can see uh, the surface anatomy of, the, of that tendon uh, compartment that I was talking about. And then there's a schematic diagram showing the tendons going through the sheath. And, uh, and then there's another schematic just showing where it's gonna be sore. And sometimes they get a bit of a lump there as well. And we, we can uh, inject that uh, with steroid. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and then if that doesn't work, we can release it similar in uh, similar to the way we released um, the carpal tunnel by just cutting that sheet. So they can come in and say, oh, I've got a painful lump. So they get referred and they say they've got a lump on their thumb, uh, just at the base of their thumb or on their wrist. And it's really painful. Um, and uh, what, what does anybody know what this might be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly because lumps are, you know, neurofibromatosis. But I think neurofibromatosis, I would normally think that that was, um, you'd have lots of those lumps. But yes, that's definitely a differential diagnosis. Um, but are the neurofibromas necessarily painful? They could be. They, if, you, if you do a Tonell sign, they might get electric shocks. But this is more, this is much more common. And it happens in lots of people. And I've actually got one as well here. Um, and, and this is a ganglion. So it's a cyst from a joint and that can happen because you're you know, quite mobile and you might have little, uh, you know, our joints make fluid all the time so that the bones can glide and the joint is covered by a capsule and sometimes uh, increased pressure causes a, a little outpouching of that capsule and the fluid that's always being made in the joint can just push through into that, make a little balloon like a cyst like that. And then sometimes it's like a one way valve because the neck of the balloon where the joint is is very narrow and the uh and the cyst is you know so the, the fluid is always being made so it goes into the balloon but it doesn't always go back and so they get this big lump sometimes you can compress it and it's smooth and if you're not sure you get an ultrasound and they'll say yeah it's a cyst so the thing is i put a question mark in in brackets there because i get referred these sometimes and they say oh well they've got a really painful lump and can you and it can cause pressure symptoms that's right but um, sometimes it can be an underlying cause for this lump and that can be this does anybody know what this is it's an x-ray showing that's an x-ray of the hand and wrist what is the red arrow pointing to there's something different about the joint isn't there can you see? So, <laughs> so you can see that the bones have these spaces in between them. So the bones aren't floating in midair. They're actually covered in cartilage and the bones are next to each other and the cartilage is, is there. And then when the cartilage wears away, the bones are sort of knocking against each other and, uh, and then they get, you know, um, closer together so that space gets smaller and uh, and because they're knocking against each other they become harder because bone is actually a living thing so the more you stress you put on it the harder it gets and on an x-ray it looks whiter um, and that's arthritis those are the signs of arthritis on an x-ray and uh, and if you've got an arthritic joint and you're bones are a little bit baggier and the, you know not baggier but looser the joints are looser because there's not much cartilage holding the tension there you can also get a, a, a ganglion as a result of that so I might get rid of that ganglion it usually comes back but I could get rid of it but it might not get rid of their underlying pain their underlying pain might be due to arthritis it might be due to all sorts of things but that's one example so it's very important to um manage expectations of a patient that comes to your clinic uh, so they don't think that you're just going to get rid of this lump and it's going to make their pain go away because it might not um, and there are different ways to treat a ganglion um, but the main thing they need to understand is that because it's a sister fluid that sister fluid might come back and recurrence is the most common thing so um and it's not without risk to have an operation because it's not a benign thing you've got to get down to the joint and um 
uh, and cut the ganglion away, cut the cyst away at the joint. And you, uh, you know, they, they'll have swelling. They might get a, a nerve problem as a result of that. They might uh, have a lot of stiffness, and they might have a pain that they didn't have before the uh, uh, the operation. And then, they, then you've done them no favors. So um, even though we like operating, uh, it's a good uh, it's good judgment to know when not to operate. OK, so I might have uh, a patient who comes in and says, I have to, you know, I get pain in my thumb when I when I grip things or when I'm trying to open jars. And this is these are pictures of an older person. Um, and that's moving on from what I've just said. Um, and they you examine them and they'll have a hand that looks like this. And you can see how their thumb is kind of pressed in there. And it's because they can't do that. They can't bring their thumb out like that. And it's because they've got arthritis so there's that x-ray again and it's that movement of the thumb out like that that makes it quite painful and we treat them with painkillers and they can rub gels on you know anti-inflammatory gels on their on their joints or we've got off the off the shelf uh, splints they can use or the pan therapists can make these special bespoke splints that hold the joint there so they can actually move their thumb uh, a little bit further up um, and not and it not be painful and if that doesn't work then we can use steroids because that works really well and when the steroids start working we can do operations where you can see in the middle picture the bone's been taken away and less commonly we could have few we could fuse that joint and more recently um, we've started to put little joint replacements in and that's like a little mini hip replacement uh, for the thumb base and that works quite well as well but it depends on the type of patient for what you choose um it's my last one um but they might say my thumb hurts and it gets stuck and i can't extend it or i can't flex it and uh it might happen to their fingers as well what do you think that is anyone yeah, yeah, and 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 again, just like the uh, de Quer veins, it's like a tenosynovitis. So they get, um, they, it gets stuck, and it can be quite painful. And you've got these pulleys that hold your uh, tendons um, uh, against your bones while you are flexing, and they get, glide up and down under these pulleys that you can see on the right side of your of the slide there. And the offending pulley is the A1 pulley. Uh, and that, again, the cells change. It becomes like sandpaper, to, that's what I say to those. It's like sandpaper for the poor tendon. It glides underneath, it gets irritated. And uh, we release that, and then it, it glides a bit better. And I've put this slide on because it looks like trigger. And I, sometimes I get people uh, being referred to me with a finger that's like that. And does anybody know what this is actually? showing yeah dupatrins and that's a really common condition which i'm not going to talk about now but sometimes um i get referred a patient and the and, and the letter says i think this is a dupatrins but actually it's a chronically um triggered finger that is stuck like that and it's been like that for a year and uh, these joints don't like these pip joints these middle finger joints they don't like being stuck like that for a long period of time so the difference uh, is again in the in the history uh, about you know with it, with pain and you know how long it's been there and also in the examination and you can see that there's a cord in the palm that's caused the, or lumps in the palm and it's hard and it doesn't tend to be painful um, which makes it different from the trigger and usually with dupatrins you can feel it in the skin it's a condition of the skin uh, whereas a trigger you're not going to feel that sort of cord scar like substance. Um, so in summary, uh, just because it's a thumb hurt, just because your thumb hurts, it doesn't mean it's just going to be one diagnosis, you've got lots and lots of things that you can be thinking of. I've only touched on a few. Um, but it's just a poor, you know, so, you know, it's food for thought for you, it could be a lot of things, but I hope I have made it a little bit clearer in how we decide, you know, decipher what it might be. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I'm going to tell you what I think is interesting about hand surgery. So first of all, who am I? 
I'm Lisa Leonard. I'm at Anderson and I've been here for 16 years. Um, so it's quite a long time. And why did I end up doing hand surgery? So when I was doing this talk, I thought maybe you guys would be thinking about doing hand surgery or you'd be just thinking about doing medicine. And I thought maybe I would try and work out what it was about it that was made it interesting. Okay, so I think you might have got the idea that there's quite a lot of things going on in the hand. And what I think is interesting about hands is that it's quite varied. It's quite varied. Patients, diagnoses, you get conundrums, you think, what on earth is that? You have a lot of stuff that's quite basic and easy to understand. And then you have somebody who comes along who really just makes you think. So that is quite interesting. And there's loads of different treatments. There's loads of different pathology and there's lots of different things we do. So it isn't just bones and joints, quite more varied than a lot of what our orthopedic colleagues do. Um, and there's always something new. And I think I hopefully I'll show you on the pictures, even some of the newer things I've done more recently are things that have challenged me even after 16 years. And it's also quite good teamwork. We've got very good colleagues, but we've also got hand therapists, plastics and orthopedics work well together. So it's uh, quite nice for lots of reasons. So I'm just gonna give you a really quick skate through with lots and lots of pictures, okay? About the sorts of things that we do do. We do planned care, which is elective, a little bit that Reem's talked on some of them. And then we do injuries and trauma and we, we look after both of those. So planned care. I think you've already seen a thumb replacement, thumb joint bait replacement, we call those hamster hip replacements. And every time you get them out of the packet in theatre, everyone goes, oh, it's so sweet. <laughs> and it is quite a cute little thing. Those have only just started being uh, more successful recently. There's a, a wrist replacement there on the right hand side. And that's a, a newer design we've been using more recently, which has um, much better results. Still not quite as good as hips and knees, but getting there. And then the proximal phalangeal joint, the little joints in your finger that we replace, they're like tiny little knee joints. I would have to say that those have not quite made it yet onto the uh, success list. We do all sorts of soft tissue tumours. So this one is a really painful tumour under somebody's nail. Does anybody know what that might be? It's a very specialised tumour, but people have had it for months or even years and they've gone to their GP and they've been ignored and it's terrible. It's called a glomus tumour. Incredibly painful and they go around the supermarket and they have to keep away from the cold bit because it's it absolute agony. It keeps them awake at night. And then the tumour on the right is uh, just, a, just an ordinary fatty lipoma, but a really huge one on the lateral side of the elbow. And you can see there uh, the post-introsseous nerve is just tethered around it. So interesting anatomy, interesting dissection, interesting pathology. Soft tissue degeneration, so all sorts of soft tissues in the hands and all of those connective tissues we deal with as well. So there is a shock absorber in the, on the side of the wrist, which somebody's very help, helpfully colored in uh, a big circle there to show you where the dye is leaking through that shock absorber. So if you just see this little bit thing here, on an x-ray, that just looks like a gap. But that's like the meniscus in the knee that the footballers are always injuring. And that becomes worn out and torn as we get older. And that's called the triangular fibrocartilage complex because we like to give everything a long name in hands. And that can be damaged and we sometimes have to do something to sort that out. This is a person who's frayed their tendon. And we've, as Lisa mentioned before, we can nick a tendon from somewhere else because some of your fingers have got two tendons. And we take one of the tendons from your index finger and root it back down through and weave it into the thumb tendon to make the thumb work again. We deal with arthritis and you've seen some osteoarthritis, but this is rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see this very classic extra scalloping. And this is where the synovitis, which is the lining of the joint that's become inflamed with the arthritis has eaten away the tissues and it's eaten away the bone. And here it is eaten away the tendons as well. So this is a picture on the on the side of the wrist. So underneath there, when you open it up, this is the joint under there with a great big hole. And all of this grot here is where this panus um, from the joint has uh, uh, gone up and into the tendons and the tendons have stopped working. And if you clean that out, get rid of the on the head, close the soft tissues underneath and repair or reconstruct the tendons. We've mentioned this a number of times. And here's another picture of thena muscle wasting, which is quite debilitating. We really hope that we um, catch it before it gets that bad. This is um, a bifid median nerve. It's the only one I've ever seen, um, but it's, <laughs> it's well described as an anatomical variant with a persistent median artery centrally. So interesting anatomy sometimes, even in your basic stuff. So injuries and trauma. Trauma is what took me into orthopedics in the, in the first place and orthopedics is bones and joints so um and 
plastic surgeons also do hand surgery. So they're, they're more, you may be thinking of them as cosmetic, but they do an awful lot of reconstructive surgery for our trauma patients as well. So trauma is what really made me want to do orthopedics in the first place. So this guy had a little bit of a mishap with a, with a, a nail gun and um, that's a six inch nail in there. And fortunately he managed to miss absolutely everything. <laughs> he was one millimeter away from his median nerve in the carpal tunnel. So down here, the nail goes all the way down underneath there and finishes in the carpal tunnel down there a millimeter away. That was quite interesting anatomy. This is a neglected infection, a lady who had a dog bite, who didn't really want to come to hospital. And this is just pus. And when you're taking all that away, I think we forget how nasty infections can be if you leave them and you don't treat them aggressively. And, um, you know, she had very little left after you've cleaned that up. It's difficult reconstruction. We need the plastic surgeons to sometimes help us with that. I haven't made these holes. This is gout. So this is a, a condition which people think is um, almost a bit of a joke, really. But this is a, an erosive crystal arthropathy. And so the crystals make this pronounced inflammatory response and the, um, the, this is eroded through the tissues here. You can see there's another big hole in this poor person's hand there. And that's quite a difficult condition to treat because the tissues don't heal very well. This is somebody who had an entertaining time with a circular saw. And if you were a baby, you would be able to reattach even that distal part of the finger. But in someone this age who just wants to get back to work, we'd probably just shorten the finger and take away the germinal matrix that makes the nail so that uh, they'd have a healing stump quickly. We treat injuries to bones. Anyone get those two? Which, what's broken on the right? Anyone know what that is? Correct. So that's quite a broken scale for you. <laughs> and this one is quite a dislocated lunate. This is a little teacup here is meant to be sitting over here, looking that way. Quite a high energy injury. We treat nerves. So this is one of the little teeny tiny nerves in your finger. So it's been cut here. Um, easy to do that with a knife when you're doing your avocados. Watch out for avocados or separating your burgers from the uh, freezer. That's a good idea. Um, and so we tend to repair those, but we use um, loops and magnification and very, very tiny sutures smaller than a human hair to repair those back together again. We repair tendons when they've been damaged. More avocados. This wasn't an avocado. This is sewn up in casualty and they were sent away uh, only to find that actually the tendon wasn't working. So this is going back to the normal cadence of the hand. If you look at your hand when it's at rest, the fingers sit in a very nice smooth curve, which follows Fibonacci sequence if you're um, mathematically minded. And this finger is not in the right place. Okay, so they cut tendons down here. And of course, over there, you might be worried they cut the median nerve as well. So, and then when you've got the hang of doing all of those, uh, look away if you're a bit squeamish, <laughs> you, you might find a chap who goes to the Ukraine <laughs> and gets attacked with a samurai sword. So this was a chap who needed everything repairing. So that was it. Lots and lots of hours of work repairing soft tissues and plastics and lots and lots of orthopedics, repairing his bones, putting them all back together again. It's only 21. He's a very motivated young man. So I think I saw him on Monday, actually, he's doing very, very well. So. So this is, this is my favorite topic. Lisa Leonard's a bit bored of it now because um, I do talk about it a lot. Um, but I, I came across lots of comments on my training. It, it didn't bother me, but I worry that it put off some nice people who would have been very so suited to surgery and very suited to orthopedics. And I don't want anyone to be put off by a comment that somebody else makes. I want people to find their passion and follow their passion. Because if you find a job you love, everything else will follow. Childcare worries, everything else will fall into place if you love going to work every day. Um, so I just want to make sure that people are doing what they want to do, not what somebody else thinks they should do. This is my little uh, passion in life. So when you ask to imagine a surgeon, this is what most people think of. Posh, old white guy with a beard, bow tie, shouting at an entourage, pretty nurse, large, scary matron, um, getting angry at everyone, shouting at everyone and bullying people around. And it's just not that way anymore. This is very, very outdated now. I did love watching these films um, when I was younger, but it's just not that way anymore. And we've got to stop making the jokes and pretending that this is what happens. 
So what was interesting, I did a study with the medical students at Brighton University, and they looked at people's opinions of, medical students' opinions of surgery and orthopedics. And they ended up with thousands and thousands because they started off a medical school here and then they expanded all over the UK and also across Europe. And they asked for people's opinion, what they heard about surgery and then their experience about surgery, what they heard about orthopedics and then their experience of orthopedics. And they got a huge amount of data. It's been published. It's been presented all over the world. Um, but before they did surgery, they were told the stereotypes. It's sexist. You have to be strong. You can't do it if you're a girl. You can't get pregnant. But then when they actually did orthopedics, they found it was really fun and they were very nice and everyone was very interesting. Um, and what we heard over and over again is that the people in A&E, the medical consultants, all the people who did orthopedics 30, 40 years ago were still perpetrating these same old stereotypes that are very different, as you can see looking at the orthopedic surgeons in the room today. It's a very different world now than 40 years ago. Um, so I think we need to get that message out there. And I love the opportunity to talk to people who aren't orthopedic surgeons to say this message and don't presume things that are different now. So some of the quotes from the um, medical students, again, asking for more visibility, saying that when they met a female surgeon, they thought they were more likely to do surgery as a female. If they met a minority surgeon, they're more likely to think they could do it. And it's about visible role models. And you can't be what you can't see is, is the old adage. So the other thing is language. Language has power. And this is why this uh, huge media campaign, I look like a surgeon, was brought out. Hashtag, I look like a surgeon. Lots of pictures of female surgeons, female nurses, people doing roles. I think they had, I look like a pilot as well, and lots of female pilots and things. So it's trying to get it out into the public arena. It, the old stereotypes aren't true anymore. You can be what you want to be just because you don't look like the old fashioned version of it. The world is changing. So why is diversity important? Why do I want to encourage diversity? Every, every study that's looked into this has shown the workplaces are happier, they're more supportive, there's more innovation. If you look at, for example, um, hand dryers in America, they only work if white skin goes under the hand dryer. There's a great video on the internet of a black guy trying to turn on the hand dryer and it just did not recognize his hand. Um, you need diversity when you're creating products, when you're investigating things, when you're performing research. Women are more likely to be injured and die in car crashes because they only use 80 kilograms, six foot male test dummies. So all cars throughout history have been made to have a seatbelt for a man. What about pregnant women? What about smaller men? What about everything other than a six foot tall, eight kilogram man? It's just never been taken into account. They now make female test dummies, but they only ever put them in the passenger seat. It's just crazy, isn't it? Um, patient outcomes are better when they're treated by someone that looks like them. They're more likely to trust them. They're more likely to open up. They're more likely to be compliant. Black babies in America are three times more likely to die than white babies. But if they're treated by a black doctor, that's halved. And they can't find out why at all. It's nothing to do with the race of the mother, but diversity is good for every single environment where people have investigated it. Um, so what is the current state of diversity? So 60% of medical students are women, and that's been that way for over 20 years now, probably 30 years but it just hasn't filtered through to surgery and it hasn't filtered through to consultants. So you can see here a third of surgical registrars are women and then it drops off and drops off and then you've got orthopedics, worst of the worst at 6%. It's gone up to 7% last year, which people are going, oh, well done us in orthopedics at 7% now. It's still terrible. So the DEACH report looked at ways to try and remove barriers and nothing really has changed since that was done 12 years ago. So when we look at women going through surgery, look at all these keen SHOs, keen to be max fax, keen to be ENT, keen to be orthopedics, and then we lose half of them at registrar level, and then we lose half again at consultant level. And the question is, what is happening? So we know they've not got role models. We know they're not seeing that many female consultants when they're starting out. I didn't meet a female orthopedic consultant until I got my run through job. I just hadn't ever come across anyone. So I was being very odd going out and choosing a career which I'd never met anyone who had done before. Um, so it's very hard to imagine yourself being a consultant if you don't see people like you doing that job. So these are the things that are commonly told to female surgeons and some people here will say no one ever said that to me, um, possibly Lisa Leonard, but they'd have to be very brave to say these things to Lisa Leonard. <laughs> so when you google female surgeon you get this grumpy lady at the top 
Whereas actually female surgeon, I think is much more likely to look like the lady on the bottom. <laughs> they say you can't get pregnant, you can get pregnant. You, you know, you, you do your research. I, I worked all the way through my pregnancies pretty much until my due date, it was fine. I worked until I couldn't operate and then I did clinics and my colleagues were very happy to take my theater lists while I sat in a boring clinic all day for a month. Um, working part-time, men and women, lots of reasons to work part-time these, these days. It's get, becoming more and more commonplace. Strong enough, come on. If, if, if you're using all your strength, you're either not doing it right or you've got the wrong equipment. Um, pushing to the front of the C-pod again as an SHO, I was taught to bully and fight and cajole and negotiate my way to the front of the C-pod. You know, make friends, take coffee and all these things that aren't relevant to which patient should be first on the emergency list. Whereas now we've gone away from that. We've gone towards a sensible discussion with anaesthetists. We're talking about blood gases. We're talking about lactate. We're talking about um, emergency treatment versus waiting the next day. It's a very different world. It's more intellectual um, arena now, the C-Pod. Power tools, power tools are my favorite thing. Possibly the reason I chose orthopedics. It's um, a close draw with somebody telling me I can't do orthopedics. So it was those two things. Um, too hormonal soft, what's wrong with being nice? You know, women, a lot of women aren't hormonal soft. In fact, none of us are hormonal, hormonal soft. But um, there's nothing wrong with being nice. There's nothing wrong to doing things differently. Patients' expectations, I'll talk about that. That is quite difficult sometimes. And good leaders, again. Again, we're moving away from a, a dictatorship leadership technique where someone just shouts at everyone and they do as they're told. We're moving much towards an autocratic, get everyone on board, take people with you leadership style. Um, so again, it's very different for the olden days. So these are the, some of the things I get a, a lot. And that this follows on from the previous comments. Everyday microaggressions, little comments, bits and bobs, and just wears you down. Every single patient I show the sutures to after I've closed them up, say, oh, you're good, but you're good at sewing. I don't sew, I just sew people. I don't sew dresses, I don't sew cushions, I just sew people, and that's how I've learned to sew. Um, my own dad said this to me, uh, why did you have kids if you're never gonna see them? So it's the classic, why aren't you a housewife question, uh, which was a bit upsetting for me, seeing as he brought me up to be whatever I wanna be. Um, I get lots of Laura this, Laura that, it'll be Dr. Mr. 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 Laura. And most people don't notice it, but when you hear it, it, it gets you every single time. So this is also to do micro questions. This is a really interesting study. One of these tables is describing men and one is describing women. I wonder if you can guess which one's which. They interviewed 4,000 um, military recruits about their leaders and the leaders were matched to skill, intellect, scores, hierarchy level, everything they could match them for. And then they compared them like for like, they gave them 300 word options and this is what came up. If you imagine a leader, you would want the person on the left rather than the person on the right. The words on the right are all emotive, emotional, kind of incompetent words. The words on the left are task-based, driven, uh, achieving goals. And this is, these are matched people. Imagine if you're hearing whispers about you describing you as the person on the right rather than the person on the left. This is again, microaggressions. Just be careful how you describe people. Orthopedic, I don't know if I can say that word, but orthopedic, Surgeons who are female often get described as a B word, uh, a scary lady. Um, you wouldn't describe a orthopedic male consultant scary by the male equivalent B word. You would say, "Oh, you know, he's very confident, he's very dramatic, or, or whatever." You wouldn't you wouldn't use those words for a woman. So you just got to be very careful with the language you use because it, it's offensive and it wears people down and it perpetrates this image. And all these microaggressions that wear you down make imposter syndrome worse. Everyone gets imposter syndrome, it tends to be more common women. And I think it's because of these little comments. There's a new theory that there's no such thing as imposter syndrome, that it's your environment that makes you feel like you don't fit in. And that if we can change the environment, people won't have these feelings anymore. So we all worry, everyone worries about having imposter syndrome. We all think we don't know what we're doing, but that's better, I think, than the other side of the coin, overconfidence. I would rather have a trainee who was worried they didn't know what they were doing or a colleague that was honest rather than someone who was overconfident. And we have to be aware that competence and confidence are not necessarily related. So we all seen this graph before. I'm a new consultant in the Valley of Despair at the bottom. Um, the male graph is exactly the same as this, but higher. So it runs parallel to but higher at every point than the female graph. So at every point of confidence, the ladies will be lagging behind. 
So you have to be very aware of the very confident man saying, I'll take that patient to theatre. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And you have to temper that confidence sometimes. Likewise, if you have someone who's nervous or you can tell that they're, they're not sure of themselves, you have to bolster their confidence. So if I have a female trainee now, after doing all this research, which I do a lot of, I will put them forward. I'll go, you can close this. And they go, oh, oh, um, 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 and they're fine and they do it. And if a man's saying, I could do this operation, I'll go, okay, talk me through the steps. And if they can talk me through it, fine, do it. But you're, you're adapting your teaching technique and you're taking into account different personalities of different people to make sure you're safe and make sure you're targeting their training appropriately. So just to be controversial, a really good study, 104,000 patients showed that women are actually better surgeons than men. So we should probably get rid of all the men altogether, really. Um, we wouldn't have many surgeons. <laughs> so this was a really interesting paper. This caused so much drama. There was so much uproar. Everyone was arguing with it. Even the authors of the paper said, well, this, we think this is because women are more likely to follow guidelines, they're better communicators, and they talk to their team more. And it's like, well, yes, then they're, they're a better surgeon then. You should follow guidelines, you should talk to your team, you should communicate more. And they're using that as an excuse to dismiss, well, this just because of these things. No, those things make them a good surgeon. The other point they made is, oh, it's only because it's so much harder for women that only the best of the best of the best become consultant surgeons. And again, turn that around. Why are all the crap men getting through when there are mediocre women being abandoned along the way somewhere? So even the authors tried to dismiss their own findings. Other studies have repeated this. Loads of ITU studies showing a 4% increase, a reduction in mortality um, with a female intensivist. And the other important thing is that these are all the same teams. They're the same nurses, the same staff, the same radiology department, just the doctor in charge is different. So that will tend you towards the null effect. So the actual effect is probably much greater. So how can you help? So I wanted this opportunity to talk to people who weren't orthopedic surgeons and weren't surgeons necessarily, just to think about how you talk to people, how you describe people, how you describe specialties, rather than going, oh, you're not strong enough to be an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, you don't look like an orthopedic surgeon. You don't look like a general surgeon. You, you've got to be very careful about what you say and don't put someone off before they don't know about it. Give them facts about the specialty, give them the opportunity to learn about the specialty, but don't put them off flat out the gate. Let people follow their passions. Say, what do you enjoy? What have you loved doing? Follow that. Inappropriate comments. If you do hear inappropriate comments, if you do hear microaggressions, if you do hear these comments, it's very, very hard to challenge them. Very, very hard, very awkward, um, especially if you're a junior. And it's someone senior making the comments. I found the best way is to repeat what the person just said and say, sorry, I don't understand. You said, da, 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 da. what does that mean? And then often that's enough. They go, oh, 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 oh bluster, bluster. No, well, I don't know. Well, I didn't mean that, obviously. I meant to. Da, 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 da. So often you don't need to challenge. You don't need to be aggressive. You just repeat back what that person just said and it will make it apparent to them. Encouraging role models, that's leaders, panels, having four orthopedic surgeons who are female today has probably made a couple of women think, oh, orthopedics looks quite fun, maybe I'll do orthopedics. And it's that um, filtered on effect through all the different specialties. And everything I say here for women is every minority. It's gender minorities, ethnic minorities, disabilities, all these kind of, every single minority, there's more appearing every day. And all of those minorities, the more we represent them, the more inclusive medicine will be and the more supportive for our patients. We need to reflect our patients. Manals, oh, this is my book birth. So many manals. Um, manals and mansplaining are really funny, but you see them a lot still. Uh, I did, the BOA had lots of um, manals and I messaged them and they said, yes, we're very interested in monitoring our diversity. It's very important to us. And I was like, so you're gonna change these 15 manals? And they were nothing. Um, so lots and lots of manuals, and you've got to call it out, and everyone's calling it out now. What about men? Oh, men only panels. Mm. It's like mansplaining. What about women only? What that doesn't happen? Doesn't exist. There's no word for it because it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from your introduction. <laughs> um, be willing to mentor trainees who aren't like you. So even though it. I'd quite like to find the loud northern girl who went to state school and make her love orthopedics. Or it's it, you want to find someone like you and pull them towards you and pull them into your specialty. But it's actually you have to be willing to recognize that it takes all sorts and that anyone can do that. And you need to mentor someone who's good at the job. You need to support the people who are good at the job and push them forward. A lot of people don't have the opportunities. So I'm, I, I'm 
becoming aware of my privilege. I didn't think I was privileged when I was at Oxford. I was like the lowest of the low, but I went to Oxford. I'm privileged. And you have to acknowledge your privilege and you have to try and look out for those who didn't have that privilege and that support at home or the support with education and help them through and give them the extra push that they didn't have. So this is yellow because the future is bright. Um, the Royal College of Surgeons did a diversity report, Baroness Kennedy talked about the problems with the Royal College of Surgeons, how it doesn't appeal to its members anymore, it doesn't represent its members, it's lots of rooms with old posh white guys on the, on the walls, and they're trying to really push to involve minorities and to positively discriminate and bring interesting new different people through the, the hierarchy. Uh, there's a women in surgery group, women in orthopedics worldwide I'm a member of, that's really fun. We've done a couple of symposiums. We did one at um, AAOS, Orthopedic Symposium in America, and we did one at the BOA as well. They're all free, they're all online, you can watch them. Um, amazing people all around the world. It, we did these great Zoom chats and there'd be 200 female orthopedic consultants all around the world getting on, allocating jobs, and we were just on it. It was the most organized Zoom meetings I've ever been to in my life. And it was really fun. Similar for the IODA, that's the Orthopedic Diversity Association I'm on as well encouraging diversity, supporting countries, like even Colombia has got better diversity than we do. Like every country <laughs> has got better diversity than we do, but we're trying to find those little pockets where they're having trouble and we're supporting them to encourage more people into surgery and orthopedics. This is my group, Women in Orthopedics, W.Orth on Facebook that I started. And now they've asked me to make it Twitter. So now I've started a Twitter group and I'm sharing information and, and reinforcing when I see a woman do well, when I see a female orthopedic surgeon become a leader of something, win an award for something, I tweet that and I show that. And it's about amplifying and showing people that there's another way, that it's not what they think it is. And that's it. That's me with my Mother's Day present. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, presentations. Uh, just one comment. Uh, it's important not to swing the pendulum from one extreme to the other. And that's as it is important to allow women. It's also important not to blacken all women, all men and rubbish them all. There are also good men who are uh, sensible, who are careful, who are thoughtful. And uh, we don't want to come in 10 years or 20 years time that we have to try to encourage men to come uh, there was a, a, a word about uh, Opsangaini. Now the vast majority in consultant posts in Opsangaini are actually women. So a lot of things have changed, uh, but it's important uh, to try to correct rather than overcorrect. Yes, that's a very valid comment. And I can see that our Dean wants to say something. And of course, in ophthalmology and at BMSS, BSMS, we have always been very diverse from the word go. We have really. So with the greatest respect, I completely disagree. Um, it, should, it should basically be on merit, but we need to actually overcorrect because we have, we're coming from a deficit position. So we need to correct that. And we probably, we need to overcorrect it because it, you know, we have had greater than 50% male and female, more females than males in medical schools for a long time now. And yet the postgraduate career in the NHS has systematically blocked the progress of women to senior positions in almost every walk of medicine, including management and virtually all specialities. I don't know the speciality, maybe pediatrics, but I don't know where there are more female consultants than male. And there's a you know, very high preponderance of, of women in what they call salaried GP jobs. In other words, not partner type roles. So there's, there's still a huge job to be done. Um, and it's difficult to, to, to say more than that, really. The whole culture has to... We want equality. We yeah. want to be thought of yeah. as better. We just want to be thought of as equal. Yeah. It shouldn't be a system that we're trying to fix. That's it. It's a problem with the system. It's not the organisation. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Can I just say something about meritocracy? So basically, that's been proved to be completely impossible. So no one is on the level playing field. There's a great um, privilege game, a privilege race, where you say um, anyone who has two parents, step forward. Anyone who had a private education, step forward. Anyone who's white, step forward. Anyone who had to work whilst they were at school or college, step back. And there's all these different things along the way. Anyone who has to support elderly relatives, anyone who's got a disabled family member, take a step back, take a step back. And what you end up with is very unlevel playing field. Um, and then when you say go on the race, obviously some of these people are gonna get there first. So what we're talking about is removing some of the breaks that put women at the back. And all minorities, I, I, I use women all the way through because we've got much more data for that. But I, this applies to every minority. And it's about leveling the playing field, taking out the things that are bad, that could be stopping people and leveling the playing field, not putting women first, but just leveling things out. Oh, great. Well, I, I thought Kali might have something to say. Kali. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, it was great listening to our four lady hand surgeons because it's not often that we get a speciality which has so many women surgeons in it. The only other equivalent I can think of is pediatric urology at Chelsea and West Westminster, which has four of my colleagues who happen to be uh, lady surgeons. And uh, I mean, hand surgery is fascinating because I, I mean, personally, I think apart from vision, hand is, hands are probably the one thing that I would need the use of because, you know, without it, one feels very compromised. And I, I did my training in Madras at the Madras Medical College. And in Chennai, we had one of the very first specialist hand units established perhaps in the world. And certainly the first one in India where Professor Venkat Swami established a hand surgery unit in the 1970s. So I've always been fascinated by hand surgery because it makes such a big difference to breadwinners. So thank you so much. And about the diversity issue, clearly, I think that's so important. And I come from a specialty in pediatric surgery, which actually has more women surgeons than most other specialties. So in fact, till recently in my department, we were sort of three and three. So we were 50% women surgeons in my department. So it's very good to hear this drive towards getting more girls into surgery. But equally important is uh, ethnicity. And so you can see, for example, if you are a woman and an ethnic minority person, the chances of you becoming a surgeon are even less. And I think we need to focus on that. And I agree with Malcolm completely that we need to overcorrect because it's not easy to say that we'll just let things take its course. And you know we need to talk about equity not just equality. So I, I'm very happy that we had this conversation today. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, Kali. So I think uh, we've explored everything now and um, we recognize the importance of equality, equity and equivalence. Um, I think now is time for a photo of the speakers, our special Scarlet, guest Scarlet a female orthopedic pen surgeon, and also our Dean, who is a male surgeon. <laughs> okay, but uh, maybe you and I can join them in a moment. <laughs> right, okay, so um, the five female orthopedic surgeons Thank you. Okay, smiley. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.